Hello, everybody. So great to be with you again. It's Professor Steve Razy at the University of Windsor coming to you for another fun and fantastic DOD K-12 STEM Saturday. Have a really interesting topic for you guys this week. I think it's kind of cool because it's tying back to a talk that I gave in one of our previous sessions. So it may be possible that you might want to look up that talk. I'll introduce it when we get to that point. You might want to watch it here on the YouTube first before you you actually try to watch this talk. You don't have to, but it's just there if you want to do it. So interesting talk. Let's take a look and see what it is that we're talking about today. So today I want to talk about the colors of the rainbow that you don't see. So if you recall, I gave a talk about a year ago on what makes a rainbow. So that's the thing that if you're interested in rainbows and you see them up in the sky and you want to know where they come from and how they form, it might help you understand this talk just a little bit more. Not necessary, but they're very beautiful and very interesting. And you can check that out right here on YouTube. If you don't want to do that, settle back and let's try and understand what's going on with the colors that you don't see and what that might mean. So the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. So we respect the long-spanning relationships with the First Nations people in this place and the 100-mile-long Windsor-Essex Peninsula and the Straits of L'Etatois of Detroit. We are very pleased to be sharing our time with you and to be able to be here and share our space and our thoughts, and we hope this is a very productive activity that we engage in together. So like I've tried to do in previous sessions when we can is throw in uh, a new word that we can maybe come away from this session with. So this Ojibwa word of the day, since we're talking about the rainbows, I'm wondering what the Ojibwa word for rainbow is. And I found this really good reference online, the Ojibwa People's Dictionary. Now, I don't uh, purport to be a speaker of Ojibwa, but that's why I like the site so much is that they have actual native speakers of the language, actually several speakers using several different uh, um, pronunciations uh, of, of each word. And I'm able to uh, give you a little snippet of that and let them be our teachers as to how these words are pronounced. So since I'm talking about the colors beyond the rainbow, the Ojibwe word of the day for today is a rainbow. So let us listen to how this is actually pronounced in Ojibwe. I think the best thing to do is I'll play it. I think you should speak it out loud. That's the best way to learn words is to hear, speak back, and then see if it sticks in your mind. So let's give this a try. Nagweyab. Nagweyab. Try that again. Nagweyab. Nagweyab. So a rainbow. Nagweyab. One more time. Nagweyab. Nagweyab. A rainbow. So our word of the day. That's great. All right. So let's talk with just a brief some introduction about rainbows. Turns out our sun gives off all the colors. So red, blue, green, all these colors together are all the different colors that the sun gives off. When you see all these colors together, the thing that we perceive as all those colors together, we call this white light. So white is actually not a color. White is the combination or superposition of all the colors on top of each other. And I have a picture here which is showing our sun. And if you look at it, it kind of looks white, I guess. But white is not an individual color. Most of the time, if you have like white Christmas tree lights or white LED lights outside your house at Christmas, uh, that white might very well be a combination of a couple different LED diodes uh, that are actually giving off different colors. And then they kind of superimpose them in the right combination. And then our eyes perceive that as white because there is no individual color called white. It's just the phrase that we use to denote the combination, the way we perceive the combination of all of those colors. So as we saw in that previous video that I gave on rainbows, that that white light is coming from the sun all the time. And when something like a water droplet can break up that white light such that the, soup, the colors of, are not superimposed or lying on top of each other, but they can actually be broken up spatially, then we can perceive the fact that there actually are a bunch of individual colors in there. And the breaking up those individual colors are what we call a rainbow. 
So here's a rainbow pattern on the screen in front of you. Most of you have kind of seen these colors. And it turns out there's an infinite number of colors in that rainbow, but we can't keep track of an infinite number of colors. So just for clarity and for ease of remembering what the colors are from one end of the rainbow to the other, we've come up with a memory device, a name of the rainbow that at least I learned in school. And I think kids all over the world learn in school. We call that Roy G. Biv. In English, we call that Roy G. Biv. And these are the first letters of the colors that we use to go from this end of the spectrum to the other. So R is red. Next color that you encounter down the rainbow is O for orange. And then Y for yellow. And then G for green. B is for blue. I is for indigo. And V is for violet. So Roy G. Biv are those colors of the rainbow. Um, sometimes in science, we don't like to show it with red on the left. We like to show it with uh, red on the right. So I'm just flipping this thing around here. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. I just don't want to confuse anybody by this. But there are a, this, for a variety of reasons I don't want to get into, we often put the violet on the left side of the screen. So let's just do it this way. It's still Roy G. Biv, but I guess we just as easily could have said Vib G. Yor doesn't flow off the tongue as much. People like Roy, because Roy is a name in English. And so it kind of helps you think of a, of a guy's name for this Colors of the Rainbow. But I'm going to put it this way. OK, so now that you're seeing this, the rainbow with violet on the left and red on the right, let's get to what I want to talk about, which is what's happening out here. What on earth is this? Is there just no light? Why, I mean, think about this. Why does it go to black on one side or uh, black on the other side? So above red and below purple, below violet. Um, is there nothing there at all? Why does the rainbow just end? Are those the only colors that really exist? It turns out, no. It turns out that the sun puts out a lot of light at colors that are actually beyond red out here and beyond violet, which is here. So at this black curve here, I'm actually showing what we call the sunlight spectrum in space. So this is kind of like the total amount of light that our sun actually puts out. And here's the rainbow of colors that we can see, but you can see all the shaded region out here. This is intensity coming from the sun that we cannot see. All of the shaded region down here, this is intensity of light, again, that we do not see. So beyond red and beyond violet, there certainly are a bunch of light. We don't call them colors because we don't perceive them. So the colors is really a word for light that we can perceive, which tells you it's not the sun, it's your eyes. The fact that there's light beyond red and violet, it's just that your eyes can't see that. So now we understand that light is one particular part of what's coming out of the sun. It's the part that we can see, but it's not a, a particularly special part. We have to concern ourselves with all the radiation that's coming from the sun. It turns out actually that your eye, just from uh, living here on Earth and the way our eye has evolved over the millennia and uh, thousands of thousands of years, is that we're actually very attuned to seeing in green colors. All right. So we, this is this curve here is showing how your eye is sensitive to all the different colors of the rainbow. And so we're not real good at seeing red or violet, but we're really, really good at seeing green. And below, uh, below beyond violet and beyond red, we just can't see. So so it's a physiologic issue. It's not anything to do with the sun. It's just your eyes can't perceive this light that is out there. And because we can't perceive it, we don't give it a name for a color because it has no color. We cannot actually perceive it. Doesn't mean it's not there. So what I want to talk about today is out here, this light out here that you cannot see. It is real. It is there. You can't see it. We call that infrared. Infra is a Latin root for below, so the colors that are below red. Over here on the other side, there is light out here beyond violet. Again, it's there, it is real, you can't see it. The light out there that you can't see is called ultraviolet. And again, ultra is another Latin root for beyond. So two types of light I wanna talk about today, both invisible, both imperceivable by your eye, but very, very real. Infrared, beyond red, ultraviolet, beyond violet.
So let's dig in for infrared and ultraviolet and see what we can learn about that. Infrared light is probably something you're actually familiar with. It's not visible to your eyes. We've already kind of confirmed that, but you do feel it as heat. So it doesn't have a color that you can identify, it, but you could definitely, if it was falling on you, you would perceive it by your skin as heat and warmth. So your eyes have a limited range of response, but the rest of the organs and your body certainly don't. You can't hear it, but you'll feel, you'll feel it because it is heat. So if you go into a fast food restaurant, maybe you see some french fries basking under some reddish orangish lamps. Those are probably heat lamps. They are putting out a lot of infrared light as well as some visible, which is why you see it. But it's mostly trying to put out infrared light to keep those fries warm. If you went to a commercial uh, facility where they were hatching chickens, you would often see baby chicks like this warming themselves under heat lamps. So again, it has a reddish orange color, color, but it's also putting out a lot of infrared light. The infrared light falls on the chicks and keeps them warm. It's real. You can't see it, but you certainly can perceive it with your other sense organs, including the sense of feeling. And you get nice and warm. And so when you're sitting by a nice warm window, a lot of that is infrared light coming through and warming you up. If you had a camera that could see in the infrared, and it turns out cameras are really good at seeing in infrared, and we have a lot of cameras that can see in the infrared, then they can actually see, quote unquote, that heat that we normally feel. So on the left here, I'm showing what's called a thermal image. So a thermal image is of one, two, three, four, five people walking down a hallway, and you can see where the thermal image is bright is where the temperature is high, where there's a lot of heat, and where the temperatures are, where the colors are cooler, bluer, darker, like the floor. There's no heat on the floor. There's no heat coming off the floor. But because we are humans, we have body temperature of 36.3 degrees Celsius that we actually emit infrared radiation and cameras are really good at picking them up. So here was a camera that was designed to take people's temperatures remotely as they're walking down a hallway. Home inspectors will also often do this. So here's a thermal image, again, false colored of, of a house. In this image, there's heat flowing out of this house and where there's a lot of fleet heat flowing out of the house, we make it white and bread and yellow, these bright colors. And when there's little heat coming out of your house, we give it dark colors like this violet, purple, and blue. And so this is good because the roof of your house should not be leaking a lot of heat. That would be very, very wasteful. Uh, this house is leaking a lot of heat from the front and maybe it needs some better insulation because all the heat that they're trying to keep inside the house during the winter is now coming right out through the walls. So home inspectors will use this type of camera to look at houses to see how good the insulation is. There is another type of infrared camera. Certain types of infrared cameras are called forward-looking infrared. We call it FLIR is the way you pronounce that acronym. So forward-looking infrared. So I want to do a little audience participation with you guys on a couple of FLIR images. Um, they're very, very good at picking up the body temperature of people. Again, you're a warm human compared to a cold background. You're emitting lots of infrared right now. You think of usually the sun is the only thing that emits it. You're emitting it right now and these cameras can pick it up. So let's see if we can play this game together. On the left, I've got a visible image. All right, so somewhere in this image is a person and this looks like a cool, cloudy, foggy morning. I don't even know what I'm looking at. A tree here, maybe a building. This is a tree. I don't see any people anywhere in this image. It's just a mess. It's too dim. It's too foggy, too hazy. I can't see anything. So let's take a look at that exact same picture through a FLIR camera. Look at this. Amazing. Immediately you can see here's a person. This is obviously a lake. It's a person walking on the far side of that lake. And this is the infrared light that that person is giving off that makes it so easy to see. Look at the buildings in the background. So much easier to pick out now. It's a one, two, three, four story building. There's heat coming out of the windows on those buildings. You can see this building in the background. But the brightest thing in this picture is actually the person and the heat that they're giving off. That's a great thermal image from a FLIR camera. Sometimes people who are looking uh, for like escaped convicts or something, if you're trying to hunt someone in the woods or if they're looking for lost people, they can use these FLIR cameras to find people in the woods. Take a look at this visible light image on the left. Very green. Do you see anyone in there? Look close. Do you see anyone in that image anywhere? There could be somebody hiding in there and you would walk right by them. You would never see them because our eyes are just limited and there's so much green we can't even see it. But the one thing that's true about this image on the left, if there's a person in there, the person's going to be emitting all this infrared radiation, all this heat, and the plants will not. So they should really stick out. So instead of using your eyes, get out your thermal imaging FLIR camera and you will see 
this. Look at this amazing image. Look at how clear this person is against the cool background. This, you would have no problem finding this person. So in this image, they're actually hiding right in here somewhere. They're hiding behind all these trees in the dark. You'd never see them. The infrared camera picks them up, no problem at all. That's being sensitive to infrared radiation. Here's a cool thing. If you have a good enough camera, you can actually see through walls. This is some Superman kind of stuff going on here. It's not x-ray vision. This is infrared vision. So here's a suspect hiding inside a very thin walled shed. Maybe this person was running. So when you're, you know, you're running, you're sweating, you're giving off a lot of heat. They're on the other side of this wall, but there's enough heat coming from that person. Maybe they're pressed up against the wall. They're actually making the wall warm and you can tell that somebody's hiding inside the shed without having to go inside. Absolutely amazing use of infrared technology. And one last thing, which is if you've ever seen uh, a night vision goggles like this, so maybe you've seen this in movies, maybe you play video games where characters are wearing things like this. So these are night vision goggles. They're actually amplifying all the available light that's around as well as infrared. So yeah, they're picking up heat signatures as well, but they take the very scarce amount of light that bounces around at night and they amplify it. And so they give these images that always have this green color. Those other infrared FLIR images were always black and white. These night vision images are always going to be tainted green, which has to just do with the, the way these cameras are actually made. And you can see these two really cool pictures taken in the dark of night by people wearing night vision goggles. And you can see here two people in a helicopter and some crew people clear as day using these night vision goggles, another form of infrared technology you might be familiar with. Now let's switch over and talk to ultraviolet. So just like infrared, ultraviolet cannot be seen by your eyes. However, like I said, your skin feels infrared because you're going to feel that in the form of heat. Your skin also feels it in the form of ultra, ultraviolet, and you can tell what this is. You guys have probably all seen or experienced this before. Yeah, sunburn. That comes from ultraviolet. So although both are invisible, infrared and ultraviolet, the infrared is for the most part very, very, very safe, but ultraviolet is actually dangerous. You can sit under an infrared lamp for a long time. You're going to get warm, but you're not going to get damaged. You sit under an ultraviolet lamp for a long time. You're damaging your skin. This is a burn. Sunburns are real burns. You can see that. So ultraviolet is a little bit dangerous. Not only is it bad for your skin, it can be really bad for your eyes. So UV exposure can cause a whole bunch of short and long-term risks. You can burn your eyes. You can get growths, cataracts, eye cancers. Um, so protecting your eyes when you're outside really is important. Ultraviolet light can be damaging to your eyes for sure, whereas infrared is not at all uh, interacting with the tissues at the front of your eye anyway. So ultraviolet is more dangerous, but usually in nature that comes along with danger is an easy, easy to stop it. So although ultraviolet is actually more dangerous than infrared, it's actually stopped by glass. Infrared is not. So if you're sitting inside a window, here's a beautiful sunny day, I'm inside the window, all that ultraviolet light will hit the window and stop. It does not make it into your house. You're completely safe inside your house, inside your car. Infrared comes right through that glass, which is why it's so lovely to sit in front of a warm window. And if you have a cat in the house, you'll see the cats are always laying on the floor in that nice sunlight by the window always. A lot of infrared energy coming from the sun and just warming them up nicely, but completely safe from the UV. Ultraviolet light is sometimes called black light, okay? So if you go uh, sometimes at festivals, parties, uh, circuses, uh, clubs, things like that, you're gonna see this purple kind of tube light. So anytime you see this purple light, we call that black light. It's emitting a lot of ultraviolet light. Yeah, there's that purple color, but it's not the purple color. Remember, ultraviolet is invisible. The violet comes along for the ride because it's violet and ultraviolet and all kinds of stuff together, but you're really using these for the ultraviolet light that they're emitting. This is for the most part safe. I'll put a caveat on that in just a little bit. So I put safe in quotes, but I mean, you can buy these things and it's not going, you know, they're commercially available. And you're not in danger from black lights at parties and things like that. It's a really useful tool. Again, one of the things I want to get across in this talk is that the ability to see beyond what the human eye can see is a great, powerful tool for science. So you can see things that your eye can't normally see. So for example, uh, safety inspectors might use them for bed bug detecting in hotels. If you travel a lot, you are always going to see infrared lights on people when they check your passports uh, at the airport. So they're authenticating forged documents, things glowing under ultraviolet illumination that they don't under visible light. Forged currency for sure, because modern 
modern bank currency also has things in that that interact differently with ultraviolet light, counterfeiters are not good at faking that. Crime scene investigators are using it to detect blood. Stuff that was tried to be cleaned up still fluoresces under ultraviolet light. And even in biology, here's a very cool scorpion that completely is fluorescing and glowing white under the illumination of black light. So uh, tools that are not available to the human eye. Uh, if you are a crime scene investigator, you're going to use these things. They're sometimes called alternate light sources. So here you can see them analyzing. Looks like some documents here. They're analyzing some clothing. Um, and it is safe as long as you wear glasses. So I wanted to show this picture that note in these technicians, both of these, uh, both these pictures, these technicians are wearing these orange glasses. It keeps the ultraviolet from coming into their eye, but whatever is glowing from the ultraviolet light is completely visible to that. So it's safe enough as long as you wear special glasses. And many of you are probably going to wind up in careers where you're using these type of light sources to so make sure you're wearing the proper eye protection. Really important when you're using ultraviolet light. If your eyes could see in UV, you would see a very different world. Now we have special cameras again, just like we had the infrared cameras. Well, we have ultraviolet cameras. So there's some things called ultraviolet photography, which is getting popular now. So here's a picture of two models, their normal face and visible light, and the same face under ultraviolet illumination. And you can really see a lot of sub uh, surface features in the skin really stand out under ultraviolet illumination, particularly on this model. Her skin looks quite uniform and, and, and nice. When you look over here, you can see all these little spots because the ultraviolet light actually penetrates a little more into the skin, uh, shows blemishes. You can look for signs of sun damage. You can look for early signs of skin cancers, things that would not be immediately visible under normal illumination. So the world will look very different if you could see in UV. Fortunately, some of those cameras can, and some of our modern telescopes can see in the ultraviolet as well. So some telescopes see out in the UV, and now we can see some really cool things in ultraviolet. We see auroras, giant electrical light storms at the poles of Jupiter and Saturn, right? So this is, we can't see these with our eyes, but ultraviolet telescopes certainly could. If you could see in UV, the planets would look very, very, very different. Here's a picture of Saturn in ultraviolet. Of course, it has the famous rings that you're used to seeing, but it looks a completely different uh, way than it does under visible illumination with a lot more different types of detail, a very, very cool picture in ultraviolet. In fact, it's these astronomical images that gave me the idea for this topic this week, because uh, just recently, a few new images just came out that I want to show you. But for example, if you could look at the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, under the different types of illumination, it would look very different. Here's what, if you know anything about Jupiter, it looks this way under visible light uh, telescope, you know, very familiar pictures. But under infrared, it looks really different. It shows you what parts of the planet are hot and what parts are cool, it tells you what's going on in these bands and inside the storm. Very, very different. And if you could see Jupiter under ultraviolet uh, um, illumination, this is the ultraviolet that Jupiter gives off that the Hubble Space Telescope was able to pick up. So an ultra ultraviolet image, visible light image, and infrared image. It's different science tools giving scientists different bits of information depending on what light they're collecting. What motivated this talk was a brand new James Webb Space Telescope image that just came out in the a couple weeks before this talk. The new James Webb Space Telescope sees in infrared. It is an infrared telescope, so it is designed to see really, really well in that infrared. And here was a picture of Jupiter in infrared. This is an amazing brand new image. Uh, this is a background star. It's showing a little moon right there. Uh, there are some rings of Jupiter that are hardly ever seen. A uh, little. This is like a little rocky trail that this thing's flying. And you can see some activity up at the poles here, the great storm. Beautiful, uh, unparalleled image that we've just never seen before with this new amazing tool. And after that, about two days before I had to give this talk, Here's another image that came out from James Webb Space Telescope. They pointed it out at Uranus. And I bet, I don't know how many of you uh, knew that that had rings as well. Everyone knows about Saturn's rings. This is Uranus's rings. So in their infrared, you can see the planet because it's warm, even though it's very, very cold out there, but it's still warmer than its background, giving off infrared radiation. You can actually see the rings of Uranus and you can see one, two, three, four, five, six moons under this great, uh, infrared image. So this ability to not just be reliant on what our eyes perceive as colors of the rainbow, to see beyond red, to see beyond 
ultraviolet is an incredible, amazing science tool. And one of the most important things about science is just to realize that the universe is so much more complicated and so much deeper and richer than we perceive as humans. To just to be limited by things that we can smell, touch, taste, see, or hear. If we were just limited to that, the world would be a much smaller place. But as scientists, we like to use all of the information that the universe gives us to increase our understanding of where we are and what we're doing here. It just requires a little bit of work to do it. And that's what makes science so fun. So that's all I have for you today. I thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate this time we get to spend together every month. I hope to see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye.